Um, yes, I'm David Schmidt, University of Minnesota, also on this project, Animal Agriculture in a Changing Climate. Um, and I am changing gears uh, a little bit anyhow, because we're focusing with this adaptation planning guide into a uh, more local approach, local and farm specific. And I'm going to get my, there, hang on. So just to start off, um, we developed a adaptation planning guide um, a couple years ago, and it's been evolving over time. And it's a little bit uh, different than scenario planning. Scenario planning in our group happened a little bit later, like how do we think about this in groups and for larger settings and also for um, uh, just it takes a group to do some of this stuff, to really think about it. You're bringing in climatologists and, and a lot of industry folks to handle this. Um, we started with the approach that uh, uh, single farm and how could we help a farmer do some adaptation planning. Yeah, so we understand that agriculture is changing rapidly, not only with uh, you know, climate change is just an add-on to all the things that are going on with markets and policies and lots of other stuff. So um, this guide was just one more thing that farmers could use to help plan for the future. Talking about our adaptation planning guide, it's about 40 pages. Um, I'll give you the URL where you can get to it later. Um, basically, it's a four steps, and I think it's really similar to what um, Crystal and Jane just talked about in scenario planning, only it's focused on a farm-specific scenarios. Um, the, the thing that we're looking at is the first, we've divided it into four steps. First step being understanding climate trends, then we assess the vulnerabilities, some may call it risk assessment, but looking at how those climate trends are going to impact our business. Um, then we look at adaptation options, evaluating options to reduce these risks or vulnerabilities. And then finally, we do um, look at creating a quick and easy plan to help uh, keep us on track with what we've decided, what we've come up with. Um, I would say that the first three, basically, um, we can get a lot of help with the scenario planning because these understanding climate trends is a group approach, uh, bringing in, like I said, the climatologist, uh, assessing business vulnerabilities. If you're a swine uh, producer, there's going to be a lot of swine producers in your area who are having those same issues and having the same concerns. Um, so doing it as a group approach to start with is really good. Um, and then also that evaluating options. I think evaluating options might be a little bit uh, trickier on a larger scale. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that happens on the farm that's really site-specific. Anyhow, so we're geared at the site-specific with this next, uh, with this adaptation planning guide. Like I said, include others in the conversations. If you're talking about evaluating options, it's always good to have another pair of eyes working on this, your consultants that are working with you on that farm. So uh, bring them all into this planning process. Um, First thing, as was talked about in scenario planning, is to identify climate trends. Um, these climate trends can be uh, quite varied, uh, depending on where you are. So you want local and site-specific trends. Uh, we can see these big climate trends, uh, maybe this in frost-free season. If we're looking at Minnesota, we want this little spot here, and we could even get it down closer um, with some more work with the climate data. Um, we're going to look at temperature. Uh, we look at not just average temperatures, but highs uh, and lows and maybe nighttime highs. You know, is it getting warmer in our region in Minnesota? Particularly, we're getting warmer nighttime temperatures, which makes uh, different challenges than if, if it was just average temperature increasing. Uh, precipitation, looking at um, not just the amount of rainfall over a annual precipitation, but also looking at that intensity of the rainfall events. Extreme weather, that's high winds or it's it's the you know 100 year flood events and what's happening with those we're looking also at annual and seasonal as they talked about uh, with Jenny and and Crystal you know winter time versus summer what's happening in those different conditions I know there's a lot of differences um, uh, in our region in Minnesota with winter temperatures and spring rainfall and that's all different so look at that and then we're looking primarily at historic trends Rather than predictions and models of the future, we're going to assume that some of those historic trends will continue in the, as we go to the future. So we're banking most of or what we're coaching people to do is look at those historic trends in this particular scenario because it's harder to get at that um, the prediction models and stuff like that as a normal producer or extension educator working with these. 
So we got a table set up for you in this planning guide to identify those weather trends. And like I said, it's, it's uh, temperatures, precipitation, maybe growing degree days, frequency of droughts. Uh, we're looking at spring, summer, fall, and annual uh, conditions. Um, take some notes, give the source of the data. This is kind of that planning guide and some um, write-up of that planning. Um, and like I said, we're assuming that those trends will continue as we do this next step. Um, in vulnerabilities and adaptation. So those climate sources, i um, not spending a lot of time here, but there's a lot of places to get it. If you're not working with a group that has a climatologist involved, um, there's some stuff online that you can get, National Climate Assessment. You can be fairly specific with what the trends are. Um, you can also look at, there's a, a, a climate at a glance where you can put in your location and find some really specific data. Climate is out of the Midwestern Regional Climate Center. Um, and they have some great data, regional climate centers, regional climate hubs, local or state meteorologists, all those places you can go to get some of this data. Like I said, it should be site-specific local as possible. Once again, these sources, I don't have links to them, but you can Google it and find those sources. Um, once you come up with these climate, you know, what we're gonna see for climate in Minnesota or Nebraska or Washington, um, we need to then think about how that's going to impact our farm. And so we have farmers going through this practices by identifying those impacts or vulnerabilities based on those climate trends that we just talked about. We just to organize things a little bit, look at farm inputs, uh, which might be feed, water, soil erosion supply. Soil erosion fits in farm inputs because that's where the crops are grown to feed our livestock. If we're growing stuff on farm, if we're shipping stuff in from outside, it's the feed um, that we're bringing in and how it might, how our inputs might be vulnerable with the climate conditions. Say we're getting large flood events and we're trying to truck in stuff and our roads are vulnerable to flooding and we should be concerned about that. Um, the second thing we look at is animal production. So that's basically, you know, uh, how the animals are producing or gaining weight in this. It could be a function of heat stress and some other things. We're looking at reproduction issues and health issues. So if it's getting warmer and more humid, are there some issues with disease that we might be concerned about? So that animal production uh, phase of the farm. And then we can look at logistics. So um, if we're grazing our animals and those pastures are prone to flooding, we can be thinking about that manure management. Once again, it's a flooding issue or uh, drought issues, employee health, is something we can think about our, or our employees gonna be able to get to the farm to milk the cows if we have some of the severe weather. Um, and also transportation, thinking about um, transporting the animals uh, off the farm, transporting stuff into the farm. Um, how are the climate conditions that we're looking at gonna affect transportation? And finally, um, I just threw this in there, exports, um, looking at markets. We don't know what's gonna happen, but we know that on a global perspective, um, those the prices that farmers are getting are affected by the climate in all regions of the U.S. and world. So thinking about that, but also thinking about um, if it is hotter and things are slower to get to market, how is that going to be timing for us? So um, those are the pieces that we're looking at, just a way to organize that evaluating vulnerabilities. Um, so once again, another worksheet that we can fill out for this where we have the farm inputs. And for instance, farm inputs, we're saying that in step one, we had decreased summer precipitation. And because of that, um, we are going to have cropland that's sensitive to rainfall. So if we're growing all our crops and we're having decreased summer precipitation, that puts our farm inputs at risk. And we can go through all those animal production, logistics, exports. Kind of thinking um, kind of broadly about what those impacts might be or those vulnerabilities might be. Uh, the fourth step then is looking at um, both long and short term uh, identifying adaptation strategies. So uh, looking at managing those vulnerabilities or reducing those vulnerabilities. Um, and with that, we look at two different things that I think um, sometimes are a little confusing. So farmers are really good at adapting. We understand that for a long time we've, you know, tile drainage to help with flooded soils and we put in irrigation systems to help us when crops are dry and we can't produce all the corn we want. Um, we are always 
looking at new farm equipment that's going to be more efficient or new crop and livestock genetics that are going to help in drought or help in hot weather or whatever. So we're doing that all the time based on, you know, last few years it's been really dry. We're going to change what crops we're planting. Um, that's called reactive adaptation. And the concern is that that may not be enough. If we're looking just at the last few years, um, are we going to be able to keep up with this adaptation if these trends continue? There's a lot of significant trends out there. There may be no trends in your area that are significant, but in some regions for sure there's going to be some changes that we have to think about, especially if we're looking at a 20-year investment. And that's where I think Crystal went back to the fact that um, there are farmers who are getting tired or seeing that maybe raising livestock outside may not be the right answer, that we have to put animals in a building because that protects them from some of these environmental conditions. I know that one of the questions in the question um, in the chat box uh, said something about the, the, if I understood it right, was sustainable agriculture. And are we thinking about more, you know, do we have to go to a more sustainable agriculture system? And I think we can all argue about sustainable agriculture. In my mind, it was more of the um, of the grazing systems. And I think a lot of the more intensively operated farms, if you're if you're bringing in feed rather than trying to grow it yourself, you might be less impacted by climate because you have more places to buy your feed. If you're all um, have all your eggs on your own farm, I think you expose yourself to a little bit more risk than if you're buying from outside and able to ship stuff in. Um, of course, you're also subject to whatever the market's uh, prices are going to be. So anyhow, the concern is reactive adaptation versus proactive adaptation. And I think there's some of that proactive approach that needs to be investigated. The other thing with adaptation, um, so we like to think about any anything that we're doing on the farm, any business, we're looking at a return on investment. If we're going to invest money in some approach, adaptation approach, um, people are looking for how much am I going to make by doing this approach. Or they're going to have to look at what is the lowest cost option. I think that it's more of the low cost option. I did a lot of work in the past uh, with um, odor and manure management, and the discussion wasn't like, what can I do to control odor that's going to make me money? It's what can I do to control odor What's the lowest cost thing I can do to control odor? And maybe it's covering the manure storage because if I don't do that, then I might be in court looking at lawyer fees. And I think that's going to be the higher value or the higher cost to me as a farmer. Um, also, if we think about return on investment versus something like fire and auto insurance, there isn't really a return on investment. It's just the cost of doing business because our the fundamentals have changed. So I think it's a little bit different approach when we're looking at adaptation options and trying to look at return on investment, if that makes sense. So once again, like uh, Crystal used the term brainstorming, um, but this is on an individual farm. So we're talking about those impacts that we highlighted before. Um, so in this first box here, we said that there was gonna be increase in rain, rainfall intensity. And then this causes soil erosion. So what can we do with that? adaptations are in the short term maybe there's um, some alternative pastures that we can put in rotation or alternative crops or plants that can protect our soils against this erosion long term or maybe more expensive are installing terraces to keep that soil on the landscape so on and on down based on those impacts that we had what are some ideas that we can have for these adaptations um, not a simple thing evaluating the economics of these different um, options then finally, the guidebook takes them and says, you know, we really, we really need to write this down. And I think the best way to do this is keep it really short and simple. Um, and then we need to explain it to others and um, it, something like this. So we're looking at uh, summarizing the first three steps that we had. So looking at the climate trends of concern, we maybe outlined six or seven climate trends. What are the ones we're most concerned about? Uh, one or two that are most concerning to us. What are those um, chances are it's because we're most vulnerable to those two trends? Um, and then we look at the adaptation options for those impacts or vulnerabilities. And we you know, brainstorm those and kind of in this 
plan, we write down what are the most likely things that we could do, what are the cheapest things we could do, what are the most um, important things we could do to protect ourselves. Um, and that's what then the priority is set. And then we set a timeline to say, you know what, we're gonna do these things in the next year or in six months, or maybe our timeline is, or our, our plan is that we need to investigate more information. Maybe we discovered a vulnerability, we don't really know what the best option is for adaptation, so we need to do some research. Um, so that's part of that plan. We're talking about a one to two page plan, simple and easy, and we make sure we talk about that plan to uh, employees or people that manage our managers on the farm and who's ever involved in our business. Could look something like this. It's a one page, two pages maybe, looking at the summary of cri critical climate changes, right? We look at the critical farm vulnerabilities. We look at those adaptation strategies, and then we list those action steps. That's all it takes. We've got our plan. Um, we tell everybody about it. We put it on the refrigerator in the break room, and we follow through. Uh, that's basically the outline of that adaptation planning guide. Like I said, it's about 40 pages. It's on this Animal Ag Climate Change website. It will be for a while. Um, 